Welcome to the 2022 CJD Foundation Virtual Conference. We're pleased to present an update from the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. First, we thank our conference partners, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. And we thank our supporters. Thank you to all of you who support through donations to the CJD Foundation and through Strides for CJD. You make programs like the virtual conference possible. We hope you'll join us for our next session on Thursday, July 21st, 7 p.m. An update on the CJD Foundation research grant recipients. To register for this session or view any recorded sessions, visit our website. During tonight's presentation, if questions occur to you, please enter them in the box during the presentation. At the conclusion, Dr. Appleby will answer as many as possible pertaining to tonight's topics. Well, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Appleby. He is director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. And we're fortunate that he's also our medical director at the CJD Foundation. Our community is so thankful for the work of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. From surveillance to testing to research. Their work and their tissue bank and their collaboration with researchers is really vital to exploring and monitoring prion disease and to helping advance the field. Dr. Appleby in particular is tireless in his support of families affected by prion disease and in his support of us at the CJD Foundation and all of our programs. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Appleby. Thank you for the introduction, Debbie. Again, we really appreciate being able to give an update to the families regarding the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. Um, for those of you who have watched these presentations in the past, it will be a little bit redundant, but I have taken care to have some novel things introduced. So hopefully it's not too redundant for those of you who have attended the conference before. So as an overview, um, we'll review the purpose of the Surveillance Center for those of you who aren't that familiar with it. We'll describe some of the activities that we do, provide an update of what we've been doing for the last year, and then also describe some future goals of what we're doing. So um, I'm very happy to say that this is the 25th year that the Surveillance Center has been in existence. Um, we started in 1997 at Case Western University in response to variant CJD, which was caused by the mad cow um, disease outbreak in the UK, then uh, transmitted to humans in the form of variant CJD. So CDC definitely wanted to perform surveillance activities and they wanted neuropathologic surveillance. So in collaboration with Dr. Pierre-Louis Gambetti, uh, they helped fund and start the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. Um, so the neuro Pathologic surveillance activities are entirely funded by CDC. And if you listen to Dr. Ryan Maddox's talk from the CDC earlier in this conference, you heard that there's a lot of synergy between the two of us. And that's because they really are our direct partner and they're our funder. The reason why they wanna have neuropathologic surveillance is because it's the only way to definitively diagnose prion disease, which is really important when you're trying to count the number of cases. Perhaps even maybe more important is it also is the only way to definitively tell what type of prion disease it is, whether it's sporadic, genetic, variant, or maybe even astrogenic. So what this allows for is the neuropathologic and biochemical surveillance also for novel forms of the disease. So we talked about the ones that we know about, but there's always a threat that perhaps there may be new prion diseases. And of course, in our country, we're concerned that this may happen with chronic wasting disease, which makes surveillance especially important for us. So again, the important focus, as you would expect from something that's funded by CDC in the form of public health, 
are preventable forms of prion disease. And of course, that includes variant CJD, medically induced or transmitted CJD, and of course, any novel acquired prion diseases, such as if chronic wasting disease were to be transmitted to humans. Um, so this is very similar to a graph that I believe Dr. Maddox showed in his presentation. So it's important to remember that CDC does uh, surveillance of prion disease using a variety of different data. So they start with uh, death certificate data through the National Center for Health Statistics. And that's where the physician puts on whether or not the patient died of CJD or something else. So they gra grab all those data and then they match it to what is available at the prion center. And of course, there could be a variety of different data available at the prion center. It could be in the form of an autopsy, but it could also be in the form of some type of clinical testing, whether it be spinal fluid testing or genetic testing on blood. So if you take 2015 as an example, these are all the cases of verified prion disease in the country. And um, all of them um, were matched with the National Center for Health Statistics and the National Prion Disease Pathologies Surveillance Center. Um, the ones that were only found at the prion center are in yellow, so 51. And the ones that were only on death certificates were at 111. Uh, everything else, had some matching with death certificates and um, surveillance center data. And I believe uh, Dr. Maddox said in his talk that about 85% of all cases of prion disease that they know about somehow do travel through the prion center, whether it be through neuropathologic uh, examination through an autopsy or through clinical testing. And that's important because that means that we're getting good data. Uh, now, of course, this map unfortunately gets uh, more and more involved every time I show it, but this is the map of uh, chronic wasting disease affecting North America. As you know, chronic wasting disease is a disease of what we call cervids. These are deer, elk, moose, and caribou. And unfortunately, unlike a lot of other animal prion diseases, it's very easily transmitted amongst its own species. It gets excreted in the saliva and the urine, urine and the feces. And of course, these are free ranging animals. So they're not like domesticated cattle where you can herd them and call them if they're, if they're ill. And of course, if they're secreting prions in the way that I mentioned across the environment, that means they're contaminating the environment too. So of course, one of the major focuses of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center is to determine whether or not chronic wasting disease can be transmitted to humans. Now, one way to do that is to look at primary transmission between deer to humans, but I think we increasingly have to remember that it may actually occur through another avenue. So we do know that other animals can potentially get chronic wasting disease, and it may be that it's very difficult or impossible for us to get chronic wasting disease from deer, but it may be much more easier to get it from another animal. So just an example, earlier this week, there was an article by uh, Dr. Debbie McKenzie's group in Canada that had an animal model that showed that beavers are potentially at risk of um, being transmitted chronic wasting disease too. So again, you know that, that's kind of a complex situation for surveillance is not only are you looking at what you know is a risk through deer, um, but you also have to look at maybe unknown risks of other animals that may be harboring the infection. Um, it's a very complicated. So one may ask, well, if you do neuropathologic surveillance and we know that variant CJD looks very different from other forms of prion disease neuropathologically, um, how do we know whether or not chronic wasting disease would look different from other forms of prion disease? And the answer to that question is what we would call historical controls. And what that means is, again, having been in existence for 25 years, we've collected a fair number of prion disease cases. We know what they look like and we can categorize them. And one way that we do that, especially for sporadic CJD, is by what we call molecular subtypes. And I'm gonna to describe to you how we do that because it's actually quite important to understand, especially when I show you data later on. So there's two factors that go into making a molecular subtype. The first factor is genetic. So we all have a prion protein gene that generates the normal prion protein that we all make that all has a function in our normal body. Um, there's a amino acid at position 129, also called codon 129, where you have normal variation, meaning that all of us have some variety of that. And you can either have a methionine or a valine at codon 129. Now, of course, you inherit two copies of the prion protein gene, one from your mom, one from your dad, 
So you can have a combination of methionine, methionine, valine, valine, or methionine, valine. Those are your three possibilities. And the second factor that goes into making up the molecular subtype is what we call the prion protein type. Now, prion protein is a little bit unique in that it's very resistant to digestion. So if we take protease K, which is an enzyme that basically breaks up proteins, and we put it on brain tissue, all proteins should go away, but prion proteins that cause prion disease remain. And what we can do is we can do what's called a Western blot that looks at the size of those fragments of protease resistant prion proteins, and we can look at the size of them. So in this graph, this is an example of a type one and type two prion protein. You'll see that the type two prion protein is a little bit lighter, at least this third band is compared to the type one. So getting back to molecular subtype, we take those two factors, the codon 129 polymorphism, MM, MV, or VV, we combine it with the prion protein type, type one or type two, and it gives us six different molecular subtypes of sporadic CJD between MM1 to VV2. Now that's very important because we know what they look like. They have very distinct features biochemically on the Western blot, on uh, neuropathology when Dr. Cohen looks at the histology slides. And they also very frequently have very distinct clinical uh, distinctions between the two, between all of them. And I'll show you an example of this later on. So we did this last year and I, I think it was helpful. So I wanna do it again. And that is what goes into a final autopsy report. So unfortunately we do know that you guys have to wait a long amount of time to get your reports. And we really apologize for that. Of course, some of those things are not in our control. Sometimes it takes a while for us to actually get the tissue from the providers. And then sometimes actually we send out the report to the physician and there's the delay in the physician um, you know, giving the results to the family. But there is also a delay within the center itself because of what we do in order to achieve a final autopsy report. And one thing I really like about the way that we do autopsies is there's a lot of checks and balances. Now that's a double-edged sword. It has its pros and it has its cons. The pros is we can be pretty sure that we're giving you uh, the most exact data that we possibly can. The downside is when you do so many different analyses, you're bound to have some incongruencies. So of course we wanna address those incongruencies and sometimes that takes time. So I'm gonna take you through right now, everything that we look at when we do a final autopsy report. And as an example, this will be a patient that had sporadic CJD of the VV2 molecular subtype. So the first thing we do is we look at clinical history. Some of this we have because of the consent form that you guys fill out for us. We appreciate you doing that for us. Um, and then sometimes we also get medical records from the physicians of the patients. And we look at things like age and duration because they can differ quite widely between different subtypes. We look at the clinical presentation and whether or not there are any known acquired prion disease risk factors like cadaveric human growth hormone, dura mater, uh, grafts, corneal transplants, or suspected or possible um, risk factors, things like uh, being a venison consumer or a hunter, things that we don't know for sure that it can transmit prion disease. There's no evidence for it, but it's certainly something that we're tracking. So in the case of this VV2 patient, they should have an age that's pretty typical for sporadic CJD, mid-late, mid-life to late life. They should have a duration that's pretty typical of the mean duration for sporadic CJD of about four to six months, maybe a little longer. The clinical presentation usually is actually quite specific in BV2 because BV2 really affects the back part of the brain that does balance, something called the cerebellum. So they very typically have a lot of cerebellar symptoms earlier in their disease course, like uh, gait imbalance or incoordination of the extremities. And then of course, they shouldn't have any acquired, recognized acquired disease risk factors like um, what I just mentioned. Then we look at uh, uh, spinal fluid diagnostic tests if we have them, and we do in the majority of cases. Of course, at the Prion Center, we do 1433 TAU and RT-QUIC um, on the spinal fluid. Now for VV2, the 1433 should be positive. The TAU should be pretty high. And uh, VV2 almost always has a positive RT-QUIC and it has a very distinct looking curve. Um, so that's helpful. So we look at those things and make sure that matches with what we would expect for VV2. As you know, we also have a brain MRI consultation program. If we have those MRIs, we'll look at it. VVT also has a very distinct MRI profile where just the middle part of the brain, the basal ganglia, 
are typically um, bright on MRI. So that should match. We look at the Western blot, what I showed you earlier. So this is another example of a Western blot with a patient sample. You have the type one and type two, which is your reference. And then we have uh, brain tissue uh, from the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the cerebellum in this patient. You can see that their protein lines up with type two. Now, I apologize, this is not from a VV2 patient or else you would see a lot more cerebellar protein than what we see here, which is none. But you get the example of what we're doing when we're looking at a Western blot. Then we do two types of neuropathologic examinations. This is what Dr. Cohen does, our neuropathologist. Uh, the histologists uh, do two types of stain. The first one is called H and E staining. And what that is basically looking at is the morphology of what the brain tissue looks like. So you can see an example of that here. The brain tissue is this pink, and then you can see that there's these holes or vacuoles within the brain tissue. That's what gave rise to its original form as a, of a spongiform encephalopathy. And then the histologist will take the brain, they'll uh, treat it with protease K like we do with the uh, Western blot, and then they'll put a stain or an antibody against the uh, prion protein. And if protein still exists, you'll see these brown deposits. Now, what Dr. Cohen is looking for is whether or not the pattern of the histology matches with what we'd expect for VV2. So we have to make sure that lines up. Of course, the genetics, there should be no mutation. And of course, they should be VV um, for their codon 129 polymorphism. So that's a lot of things that we're checking. And again, when you check that many things, um, it, it's not uncommon for them not to always match up perfectly. So if they don't match up perfectly, we go back and we try to find an explanation for why they're not matching up. And that may be a variety of things like specimen quality. Maybe it was a really long duration case because there was life prolonging measures that was done with the patient. And sometimes that can affect what the brain looks like under the microscope. Um, an example of RT quick, maybe the spinal fluid had a little bit of blood in it, which altered the RT quick profile. So these are all things that we look at. Of course, there is always the potential of a potential mix up either on the provider side or our side. So we're able to look at that. If there's uh, you know extreme disconnect between all these features, but all of these things take time. And of course, sometimes we have to wait for the brain to be ready to do these things. For example, for the histology, the brain has to sit and fix in chemicals in order for us to do the analyses. So we do say that we try to get the final report out as soon as we can, but it usually takes up to three months because we're doing all of these things to make sure that we're giving you and the CDC the most accurate data possible. Okay, so what does the surveillance center do? Well, we talked about the core mission and that's the neuropathologic surveillance. So that's really the key of everything that we do, but we do a lot of other things in order to fuel that mission. For example, in order to get autopsies, we help physicians make the diagnosis by providing clinical diagnostic tests. We also do outreach and education to help increase awareness of the disease. We sometimes will do specific consultations with physicians and also we have research. So for the clinical diagnostic tests, we do 1433 tau and RT-quick. And of course we do genetic testing on the brain tissue, but we can also do it on blood, either on patients that don't wanna have an autopsy or in family members that wanna know whether or not they carry a mutation. We do a variety of outreach and education activities. A lot of this is in conjunction with the CJD Foundation, which has been an excellent partner for this. Um, a lot of times they'll help coordinate grand rounds, of neurology, medicine, psychiatry, um, or even mortuary services. Uh, we try to get as many publications out there as possible, of course, research publications, but as much review articles as well and chapters. Um, we try to uh, improve our internet as much as we can, our website. And then of course we work with key partners like CDC and um, the CJD Foundation. Now, sometimes one of the best way to do outreach and education is one-on-one. -on -one. And we do that sometimes with physicians that call the center. They have questions about the, the uh, spinal fluid testing or the MRI. And that's an opportunity for us to, to raise awareness. Um, a lot of times the, we work in conjunction with the state public health departments um, in their specific cases. Um, of course, we have the MRI consultation program where a family or a physician can send us the MRI and our neuroradiologist, Dr. Beasy, will read it and send a report back to them. And then I also have a clinical uh, longitudinal study called TAP-CJD, where we do remote visits. It's a research study, but it often helps the families kind of understand what's going on with the illness, 
And we're always willing to speak to uh, the patient's physicians as well, if they would like uh, to discuss the case. And then we have research, as you can probably imagine, a lot of us, a lot of our research is, you know, just properly characterizing all these cases so that we know exactly what we're looking at. But of course, we always want to improve diagnostics because that helps us improve uh, counting of cases. And uh, when we collect so much tissue and fluid on these patients, it really is our ab obligation to provide these specimens uh, to other researchers the further the field. So we also act as a research platform in that piece. And then we do have um, a lot of faculty at the Prion Center that also have independent research programs that are not directly tied to um, the Prion Center. So I mentioned my uh, teleneurology assessment program for CJD, um, uh, Dr. Zhao. Um, and I, I believe this started out as a CJD Foundation grant. He started doing RT quick on skin of prion disease patients and now has moved that towards Parkinson's disease as well. Dr. Cowley is an associate director of the Prion Center. Uh, he's very interested in looking at prion disease and other co-pathologies that go along with it, like chronic traumatic encephalopathy and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Kong has a variety of chronic wasting disease related projects, often using animal models. And then Dr. Shetty uses copper number variants in prion disease to look for explanations for things like whether or not there, that causes an earlier age of onset or uh, increases the risk of, of prion disease. And that also was one of this year's CJD Foundation grant. Another CJD Foundation grant this year came from Dr. Jamie Nugas, who's trying to optimize uh, spinal fluid RT quick and improve diagnostic modalities in that respect. Okay, so now I'm gonna provide a quick update on the prion center activities in the last year. Uh, so this is a uh, um, involved table, but it's really kind of the crux of what we do. So these are all the neuropathologic cases that we've examined. Now we go all the way back to even before 1997, but just to make it somewhat readable, I cut it off at 2001. Uh, what you'll see here, these are all the brains that we received. These are the total number of referrals by year, how many wound up being prion disease, and then subdivided by sporadic, familial, iatrogenic, or variant CJD. So sometimes it takes a while for us to get the tissue and get all the analyses completed. So I'm going to use 2020 as our example, because believe it or not, we're still actually working on some 2021 cases, because this is based off of the year of death. So for 2020, we received 364 brains, 252 of them were prion disease. And as you would expect, the majority of them were sporadic, followed by familial. And then we had one iatrogenic CJD case. Now, we think that the majority of risk of iatrogenic CJD has been removed. But the problem with prion disease is there's a very long incubation period. That's the time that someone's exposed to prion disease to the time that they develop it. So we still see cases of prion disease where the exposure is 40 plus years ago. And that was this case. This was a case of someone who received human growth hormone from a cadaver more than 40 years ago. And they just presented with um, CJD uh, and passed in 2020. Importantly, again, one of the main missions of our center is uh, classifying and finding variant CJD. We've only found four cases. All of them were thought to have been acquired overseas. And we haven't really had one and since uh, 2014. But again, it's important to keep looking because of these long incubation periods. I mentioned down here, you know, we look at sporadic and we talked about the different forms of sporadic CJD, but there are two other sporadic prion diseases that are not super common, but we still follow them. And that's variable protease sensitive prionopathy, of which we have almost 80 cases to date. And then basically the sporadic form of fatal insomnia, uh, which we have 37 cases of, which is more than um, any, anywhere else in the world. Um, and these are important cases to collect and know about for research endeavors. Now, one could ask if we're looking for chronic wasting disease, we assume it's gonna look different on brain pathology. That's why we're doing autopsies. But what if it's not? What if it looks like another type of known sporadic prion disease like MM1 or BV2? Well, one way that we can do that, of course, is to count the number of cases, but it's not uncommon for these transmissions to have low transmissibility rates. So you might not see 
a huge increase in numbers at the beginning of a transmission event. So you can't rely on that alone, although you should look at it. So another thing that we do is we look at the different subtypes and we see if the percentage of those subtypes differ by year. So that's what uh, this is for 2021 and 2016, 2011, 20, uh, 2006. So these are the percentage of these subtypes each year. And they're pretty much the same. There's a little difference in MM1 because we did change the way that we did combined subtypes where you can have type one and type two. So that explains that. But everything else is, is pretty much in relation to what you would expect with normal variation. The other thing we look at is age. So age, for reasons that we don't understand, is very important for acquired prion disease because younger people tend to be more predisposed to the acquired forms like variant CJD and atrogenic CJD. So it's possible that chronic wasting disease, if it were to transmit to humans, could actually result in younger cases. So then we're also looking at the average age of um, these prion disease cases, and they're about the same overall. And again, about the same also, even within disease subtypes. So that's just an example of uh, a couple of different things that we do to, to look at uh, abnormalities or to look to see if there are abnormalities in these cases. So this is a graph that looks at the number of cerebral spinal fluid specimens that we received every year. So um, as you can see, uh, we get a lot of spinal fluid specimens. I'm gonna call out a couple instances here. One is 2014 is when RT Quick was made available through the Prion Center. And then when the um, CDC updated its diagnostic criteria to include RT Quick, we started reporting RT Quick on all samples. Now, before that, we were getting about a 10 to 15% increase of samples every year. Uh, after that, it actually increased a lot more because, uh, again, thanks to the help for the CJD Foundation, um, I think the awareness of the power of RT Quick has really gotten out there to the physicians. Of course, you see the dip with the COVID-19 lockdown. I showed this last year. Um, there definitely was a decrease in the number of samples that we got during the lockdown, and there wasn't really a reciprocal increase after that. Um, but it looks like that we have recovered from that. And if uh, we're at that halfway point now, we're looking at approximately 7,000 samples that we would have received this year. Um, one thing that we can do now that RT Quick is part of the diagnostic criteria and it is so specific, meaning that it's really rare to have a false positive, is you can use that in counting cases. Before, we couldn't really do that unless we had an autopsy. So, this is the number of RT Quick positive cases that we've had every year. So, these are almost all certainly prion disease. And then we can combine the number of cases that went to autopsy, which we would define as definite prion disease combine it with RT quick positive cases that did not go to autopsy and get this combined probable definite prion disease cases based off laboratory-based diagnoses. And when you look at that, then we start getting much closer to the numbers that Dr. Maddox showed in the CDC. Um, so really RT quick is a powerful uh, diagnostic test, of course, but I think it also is a very powerful tool for surveillance as well. We receive blood for genetic testing. You can see that that's been fairly stable over time, although there is a trend for a decrease. Uh, that is probably because there are other um, places that are offering genetic testing for the prion protein gene, which is a little bit unfortunate. Uh, one of the nice things about the prion center, it is kind of a, a consolidated center for all things prion disease. So we do lose some data when that happens. Um, but uh, we still do get, I think, the majority of genetic testing done through the center. Uh, these are the brain MRIs that we've received over time. Uh, you can see that uh, the, with the foundation's help, again, we certainly get a lot of uh, MRIs, and the vast majority of them are suggestive of prion disease. Um, again, we get all these tissue, and then we share them with researchers. So in 2021, we shared a total of 604 specimens of course, the majority of those were brain specimens, but um, we also shared a variety of other specimens for research. And then if you look at the breakdown of researchers that uh, received specimens from us in 2021, uh, most of them are American, um, but we do also collaborate with international uh, researchers as well, such as Canada in 2021, but we've collaborated with Australia and with, and with the UK as well, uh, as well as um, yeah, Italy and other countries. So it just differs by the year.
And then of course we have a variety of different research publications that we do. Um, on the left here are basically uh, publications from last year that we looked at really trying to characterize specific cases to help with surveillance, but also to help with things like diagnosis and for classification. And then uh, 2021 was really the year of VV1 for us. Um, that it's partially my fault, um, I think, because uh, yeah, I've seen a couple of BV1s lately, and they're just a, a very strange prion disease in that they affect sometimes extremely young individuals. And these are people that, you know, after myself seeing them and talking to the family members and knowing that there really are not any recognized acquired prion disease risk factors, it, it's really kind of hard to explain the sporadic nature of them. So um, myself, as well as uh, Dr. Callie, have really uh, taken more of an interest in the subtype uh, and hope that we can have a better explanation and maybe that helps explain other forms of sporadic CJD a little bit better than what we currently have. Uh, so I'm gonna end with some future goals of the center. Uh, we're gonna, of course, continue our neuropathologic surveillance activities. We really wanna streamline our clinical testing operations. We kind of have to at this point because of the number of specimens that we receive. So we are now doing automation where we use something called a Bravo that will pipette things automatically for us. This will probably allow us to do um, more RT quick runs. Now we're always going to be somewhat limited uh, because RT quick does take 60 hours, but also it takes time for the specimens to get to us. But uh, we do think that this will speed up um, the, uh, the ability to get test results out. So we definitely want to try it and uh, hopefully we can start this at the end of the year or maybe next beginning of next year. Um, one thing that's very exciting that we've wanted to do for a while and with the help of Dr. Shetty finally did just a couple months ago is we moved the genetics laboratory actually into the Prion Center. So before it was done with our associated hospital, but now we're doing it. And that has a lot of advantages. Number one, potentially we could do it a lot quicker, but it also allows us to do a lot of more high tech genetics that can really be helpful for things like research and surveillance. And you're gonna hear about that in Dr. Shetty's talk, I think on Thursday. Of course, we're always gonna do more educations. We especially wanna target morticians and funeral directors. So uh, we've gotten buy-in from a mortician that we've been using for a long time, uh, who's really willing to work with us even more now. And uh, we definitely wanna reach out more to those uh, parties. And then very importantly, uh, because we're kind of the um, reference lab in the U.S. for prion disease when it comes to clinical testing, it really is important, I think, for us to help with um, upcoming clinical trials and their rollout. So the reason why I say that is because the, the, the best way to actually increase the diagnosis of a disease is to actually have a treatment or to have you know, the possibility of a treatment through a clinical study. So that's going to help. But we also need to let people know that when they're diagnosed with prion disease, they may actually be eligible for a clinical trial. So one of the things we wanna do is when we issue reports on our clinical testing, so we have language on those reports, notifying physicians that, hey, your patient may be eligible for a clinical trial, um, follow this link to find out more. And hopefully that will increase the awareness of clinical trials, but also increase the ability to get patients who may be eligible for them into a clinical trial sooner rather than later. I think it's important that we do talk about why we ask for increased funding for prion disease surveillance. And um, for those of you who have not participated in advocacy, you might not know the rationale. So I just wanted to talk about that. Um, you have to remember that the line item that we have uh, for prion disease surveillance is for prion disease surveillance as a whole. It's not just for the center. So that money is used for all of our nation's prion disease surveillance, which includes the CDC activities that Dr. Maddox talked about, and also their funding of state public health departments. And then of course, it also funds the surveillance activities of the prion center. Um, so we usually get about half of that, but it really is used for a lot of other things. And unfortunately, as you saw that map that I showed earlier, um, there's a need to fund more state public health departments because more states are being affected by the by chronic wasting disease. I think the last count is 30 or 31 states are now affected. Um, so really that's kind of um, a pool on that money is having to you know, increase more uh, states. And then of course, 
uh, around COVID-19, the autopsy coordination costs started to rise. And then after that, pretty much all providers increased costs. And transportation actually is a very big cost for us. And with you know the fuel rising prices, that uh, is becoming an issue. Um, so the cost of just doing the coordination of autopsy has increased. But ideally, what I would like to do is when we get to the end of a budget year, oftentimes we see that we're um, ahead of budget, we're over budget. So in order to make budget, we have to start screening autopsy referrals. So for example, this year, we really started had to start screening more um, the beginning of the summer. And we don't want people to take advantage of our autopsy program to just try to get a free autopsy. To be honest, that very rarely happens. And our autopsy coordinators are great at recognizing that. And we do not do those cases. But, you know, sometimes it really isn't in our best interest to do some of these autopsies um, or it's questionable. And if we don't have the funds, we have to decline them. But what I would really like to do is unless those are situations where it's very obvious that they're trying to take advantage of the opportunity um, and it's not pre on disease, we don't want to have to screen any autopsy referrals because, again, we don't know what chronic wasting disease would look like in a human. So we really have to take all potential cases. Um, so that's really why we're asking for more prion disease surveillance funding as a whole. So these are the wonderful people that I get to work with every day. Um, these are the staff and faculty of the prion center. I wanted to uh, call your attention to a couple of people because it's often helpful to have a uh, face with a name. If you had a autopsy done through the uh, prion center, you most likely talk to one of these two young ladies. It's Danielle and Megan, they're autopsy coordinators. If you ever called the surveillance center, you most likely talk to this young lady, that's Benita Hester. If you called a few years ago or you emailed recently, you may have talked to Katie. Uh, I also wanted to uh, shout out to uh, Casey, who's our database manager, who really helped me put a lot of these data together. And then I also want to call attention to this Thursday uh, with the videos for the 2021 CJD Foundation grants. Um, three of our people got awarded grants. Dr. Zell will be talking about a treatment-related grant. Dr. Shetty and Dr. Nuguez will also be talking about their grants, respectively. Um, and these two individuals are new to the center for about the last two years. They're new to the field of prion disease but they have very specific ex expertise that makes them very valuable to our field. And this is where I think the foundation grants can be really helpful is it really provides funds and an opportunity for these individuals to become prion disease researchers, whereas they might not have done that otherwise. So I just wanna end with a thank you to all the families and to the CJD Foundation for all your help and support over the years. And I really look forward to possibly seeing everyone in person next year. Thank you. Hey, good evening. Um, so I'm going to have the attempt of doing my own moderating session. So I apologize if it feels a little bit awkward. Um, we do have some questions that we'll go over. Um, I did want to say one thing that I forgot to uh, during the talk, and that is I I'm very fortunate to be able to have direct interactions with the CJD Foundation, with the families, and with the patients. But um, I would say most of the people I work with at the Prion Center do not get that opportunity. And um, I think sometimes they don't realize the impact that um, they have on, on you guys. So if you wouldn't mind dropping a uh, email or a phone call expressing your appreciation, I'm sure uh, they would like that. Uh, so questions. Um, the first question that we had was, can CJD be misdiagnosed? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, any illness could essentially be misdiagnosed. Um, I think it's a very interesting way to ask the questions because usually um, people have a bias on that question when they ask it. So for example, they'll say, um, is CJD underdiagnosed? And uh, so I, I thought the phrasing of your question was interesting because you're right, it is misdiagnosed, but in both directions, it can be underdiagnosed and overdiagnosed. And what I mean by that is certainly we're not capturing every single case. Um, I think we're capturing the vast majority of cases, um, either through um, autopsy or RT quick or through death certificates, um, but it is impossible to have 100% um, ascertainment, right? Um, but also we see that there is an overdiagnosis of CJD as well. And the evidence for that is in the autopsy program. So of all the autopsies that we receive, 
um, about 70% are prion disease, but about 30% every year are not prion disease. There's something else uh, that were misdiagnosed as prion disease in life. And um, usually those misdiagnoses are a variety of things, including um, other neurodegenerative illnesses or progressive brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal dementia. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes there are treatable causes um, that are misdiagnosed as prion disease. And of, and of course, we really don't wanna see that happen. Um, let's first do no harm. It's a very good question. Um, the second question that we had is, can the COVID-19 vaccination of any manufacturer potentially be the cause of this fatal brain disease? Um, and it's a good question. It's been popped up several times, so I don't want to belabor the point too much. Uh, we have talked about it several times, um, particularly on the uh, video that we did with CDC. Um, I think the evidence is pretty striking that there does not seem to be a correlation between either COVID or the vaccine with CJD if you look at epidemiologic numbers. Um, unfortunately, CJD is a rare disease and COVID is a very, very common disease. And the COVID vaccine, you're gonna get very frequently in multiple doses. Um, and you're more likely gonna have the vaccine in older individuals. All of those things kind of have a perfect storm where you're gonna expect a certain number of individuals develop CJD either shortly after developing COVID or shortly after receiving a vaccine dose. Um, so if you wanna hear more, we did talk about this with Dr. Maddox, the CDC, um, please check out the CJD Foundation website and listen to that. There's a couple questions that um, ask about progression of the illness. Uh, again, I, I think some of these questions are really good. Uh, one person asked, is there a way to predict the progression of the illness? And um, the short answer to that is no, not exactly. However, we do have certain tools that can at least allow us to have an educated guess at progression in terms of uh, survival time. So from time from onset to the time that the patient passes. Uh, there was a study done by a group in Germany that looked at a variety of different factors, some known, some not yet known, um, to predict progression or uh, illness duration. Some of those things include female gender, age of onset, younger people tend to live longer, total tau level. So the higher the tau level, the more aggressive the disease tends to be and the shorter the duration. There's that codon 129 polymorphism that I mentioned. Uh, again, there's differences in survival time depending on that uh, codon 129 polymorphism. Um, and among other things that they showed in, in that study where they actually had a nice grid where you could kind of track uh, estimated progression for an individual. Um, there's another form of progression, of course, aside from just illness duration, that is uh, what to expect next in terms of symptoms. And with CJD, it's a highly variable illness. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the clinical symptoms. All patients don't present the same and all patients don't progress the same way. Um, however, there are some kind of uh, large and fast rules um, for different molecular subtypes that you can sometimes get a sense of that while the patient is still living based off of things like presenting symptom and also potentially MRI profile where, where the lesions are in the MRI. Again, this is uh, not a very accurate way to do at this point, um, but it may be helpful enough for the reason why you're asking. Um, so someone who's knowledgeable in prion disease will probably be able to give you some sense of progression um, although they're definitely not going to be right um, all of the time, and there's going to be a lot of variability in, in what you expect in each case. So there's, uh, there's two questions uh, specifically about illness duration. One is a specific question about someone's loved one um, who seems to be having a rather slow progression. Um, I think symptoms started in October 2021. Um, and then there's another one that asks about the percentage of people that have this for more, uh, for more than one to five years. Um, so unfortunately, this is for most people a very quick illness. Um, the average time from onset until death is about four to six months. But again, there's a lot of variability. Um, some studies show that about maybe 20%, that's probably a high estimate, um, will live longer than a year. But there certainly are people that live longer than a year. I think especially in sporadic cases of CJD, um, it's unlikely to see people that live 
uh, over three years, although occasionally you'll see that. A lot of that does have to um, depend on uh, management of the patient as well. So for example, if um, the patient has a feeding tube, that is gonna lead to a longer duration uh, compared to if they did not have a feeding tube. Um, there are some genetic forms of the illness that do have a longer duration. Um, sometimes it can be uh, five years or even longer for some forms of GSS, uh, grossman strauchler schenker disease, which is a, a genetic form of CJD. So uh, you definitely see people that live longer than a year. Um, it's not super common, but it happens. But uh, again, multiple years, um, not super common. That's a minority, by far the minority of cases. Another question asked, um, we know that some people can get prion disease, specifically variant CJD from infected meat, meaning uh, meat contaminated with Macau disease has happened in the UK in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, this question asks, is it possible that you can also get transmission through unsterile dental tools? Um, very good question. And uh, this actually has been looked at. Uh, in terms of variant CJD. And the reason for that is variant CJD is a little bit different than the other forms of prion disease. There's no epidemiologic or human to human evidence that other forms of prion disease can be transmitted through blood, but there is evidence that variant CJD can be transmitted through blood. And the reason for that is likely it's a acquired prion disease and because of its acquired prion disease, it tends to reside in tissues that make blood cells and form our blood. So that's the theory for why variant CJD seems to be uh, at least readily identifiable as transmissible through blood and the other forms do not. So the study I'm referring to was on dental uh, instruments. Um, was that at risk of transmitting variant CJD? Uh, and I don't remember the details of that study off the top of my head, although I know it certainly exists. I can tell you that there are no identifiable cases of um, dental instrument uh, transmission of variant CJD or any other form of prion disease. Uh, another question, have prion disease ever been detected in other animal sources? Um, and the person mentions lamb, bison, and pigs. And, and I think this person is referring specifically to domesticated animals that may enter our food supply. So we do know that animal prion diseases exist. Um, it was first discovered in the form of scrapie, uh, which affects uh, sheep um, and goats, uh, but also, of course, bovine spongiform encephalopathy in cattle, um, which was transmitted to uh, big game cats uh, in, in a zoo, um, as well as I think some domesticated uh, cats, um, also uh, minks, and uh, of course, cervids or uh, deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Um, so one might ask if we know that there's a prion disease in sheep and lamb, um, why is that not a concern for uh, human transmission? And that would be a very good question. Um, and in fact, this is kind of how surveillance started in a bit is by looking at uh, different rates of CJD across the world, dependent on their incidence of scrapie in these animals. And what we know is that there are some areas of the world that have no scrapie whatsoever, but they have the same incidence of prion disease as the rest of the world. So that definitely demonstrates that it's not a cause of uh, all prion disease, um, but also there's been no... Uh, identify transmission of uh, scrapie to humans. And of course, because it was one of the first prion disease uh, discovered, there's a lot of um, precautions that are taking place, not just from human transmission, but even more importantly, animal to animal transmission with scrapie. And I'm sure um, our, our vet community uh, and animal people could speak a lot better of that. Um, So one question is, um, why would the American Red Cross or the blood banks accept blood donation from an immediate family member who was diagnosed or died from CJD? Um, that's a good question. And there's a, a couple of caveats to that. So it used to be that uh, there was a broad blanket on if you had a family history of CJD, you could not give blood. Um, 
without any reference to whether or not your loved one died of sporadic or genetic CJD. So for example, if your loved one died of autopsy confirmed sporadic CJD, you still weren't allowed to give blood. Now, of course, um, that doesn't make any scientific sense um, because uh, you, know, you, you as an individual family member have no increased risk of developing CJD if your family member had sporadic CJD. Um, as I think was mentioned in Dr. Maddox's talk uh, in the CDC talk, uh, the American Red Cross did remove blood donation uh, screening questions for immediate family members. Uh, it's a little bit um, different in that uh, they don't screen for it, but if you volunteer the information then you can't give blood. Um, so I'm not going to um, discuss why American Red Cross has made that because that's not really my, um, you know, my, my responsibility or goal, and I don't want to speak for them, um, but I think it um, at least somewhat has to stem from all the negative uh, look-back studies for blood transmission of non-variant CJD. Uh, one person asked how the brains are packed for shipping to our lab. Some of it depends on where the brain is coming from. Most of our providers will freeze one half and fix one half. Uh, and send it to us. We usually send out our own boxes, our autopsy coordinators will send our providers our own boxes um, that they can use uh, so to make sure that they have the appropriate um, containers to do the shipping. Uh, but it does somewhat depend on who the provider is. If you want more information, that information is on our website at cjdsurveillance.com um, underneath the protocol section. There does seem to be an increase in younger victims of CJD, at least from the CJD family Facebook page, which I would highly recommend. Um, a very good support uh, network there. Um, would you say that they are typically correlate to VV1 or could there be a different cause that is to be determined? Um, so actually there has not been an overall increase in younger cases of CJD that we've seen statistically um, over time. Um, I think we hear a lot more about them for two reasons. Number one, um, you're much more likely to remember hearing about a young case because it is so uncommon and unusual. Um, but then also some of us researchers are, are just really interested in learning more about these younger cases in the hope that it could potentially help us unlock clues to other forms of prion disease. If you looked at uh, Dr. Ryan Maddox's, one of his slides, he looked at the incidence of prion disease by age. And it's still extremely rare to have prion disease at a young age, uh, even in uh, you know, 2020, 2021. One person asked, what other labs do RT quick testing in the US? And um, we're the only lab in the US who does RT quick uh, for prion disease. And um, we also do it for some other countries. How much does it cost the center to perform an autopsy and what charge is there to the families? So the, the charge is highly variable. Um, it can be a lot uh, for some providers. Uh, we try to choose uh, the cheapest providers that we can. We have a network of providers around the country. Uh, most of them are, are pretty reasonably priced. A lot of our cost is around transportation. Um, so we cover the whole U.S., even the U.S. territories. We've done cases in Puerto Rico. And, and a lot of the um, cost is in transportation, whether it be the body or um, what we try to do over that is transporting the mortician who's going to do the service for us. Um, so that also adds up to the cost. Um, so I, I don't want to give you a, a, uh, an estimate because it's so highly variable, but it's definitely in the, in the thousands of dollars. Um, there is no charge to the families. Our autopsy program is completely funded by CDC and there is no cost to the family. Uh, one person asked about death certificate um, saying that um, the cause of death was Alzheimer's disease um, when the patient had a autopsy confirmed sporadic CJD. 
And if you look at Dr. Ryan Maddox's talk um, and actually one of my slides that I showed, you can see the different sources of uh, prion disease surveillance data. We would still capture that case because it had a positive autopsy, regardless of what the death certificate said. Although we definitely want to encourage physicians to fill out death certificates appropriately and to list the proper cause of death, uh, even if it's after the autopsy. Um, but for surveillance purposes, it's not essential. We would still definitely capture that case and include that case in our data. Uh, one person asked, are there known triggers that activate CJD, illness, stress, any studies looking at this? Um, none that we are aware of. Um, this is for specifically for sporadic CJD and for genetic forms of, of CJD. There doesn't seem to be a trigger uh, to activate it. One question asks, if CJD can be dormant in the body for years, is it possible that there could be more acquired cases that we aren't able to defin definitively determine? Also, in regards to COVID, well, let, let's just start with that one. So um, actually, you're, you're very correct. And this is, I think, one of the scariest things about chronic wasting disease, because um, before we knew what prion diseases were, they were termed slow viral illnesses. And that is because of the long incubation period, that time from exposure to when someone became ill. And um, in acquired forms of the disease, it's usually measured in years, sometimes decades. So if chronic wasting disease is transmitted or being transmitted to humans, we wouldn't actually see that in the form of documented cases until that incubation period, whatever it is, has, you know, expired for that individual. And that usually is going to be, again, in, in the order of years. Um, in the case of variant CJD, I believe the average incubation period was 10 years. So this is why uh, we don't encourage uh, hunters to eat uh, contaminated meat with CWD. Most states will offer testing for chronic wasting disease, and we would recommend that people do that. And again, if you're uh, animal test positive for CWD, I really would avoid eating it. Uh, there's one question is what is the cause of sporadic CJD? And, and that's a, an excellent question because we really don't know. Um, we did talk about this, I believe at last year's virtual conference. And um, there's a short clip of it. You don't have to watch, you know, 30 minutes. I think it's like a, under a five minute clip of us discussing it on the CJD Foundation's website and on their YouTube. Um, but the two prevailing theories of sporadic CJD is number one, um, we make abnormal proteins all the time. For whatever reason, we make uh, abnormal prion proteins. We're not able to clear them properly and we develop the disease. And that would match with an age associated illness like we see with prion disease, which is what you see with Alzheimer's disease and even with cancers. Um, the other theory is what we call a somatic mutation. Instead of having a mutation that you inherit from your mother or father, it would be a mutation that happens um, after you are formed in, in, in the womb, um, for example, in the brain, and that would cause a prion disease. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. Both could potentially be causes, and there could be other causes that um, you know, we're not thinking about either. Um, there was a second part to an earlier question. Um, the COVID vaccine, um, can it be dormant for years? Could it possibly take years for us to know the answer to these questions with COVID? Um, so again, this was discussed last year's virtual conference. There's also a, a abbreviated clip on the CJD Foundation's YouTube that you can watch. You don't have to watch the whole um, CDC talk with Dr. Maddox. Um, you know, prions are, are small proteins that are transmitted. So the vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. So it's not made of uh, any kind of proteus uh, material that would be a, a prion transmission. So if theoretically COVID vaccine were to transmit it or COVID were to transmit it, it would have to be some type of triggering event. 
And um, that leads to the question is, if, if you trigger it, then how long does it take for you to see symptoms from that event? And that's something that we just don't know. Um, so for example, in sporadic CJD, we don't know how long the misfolded protein is present before we see symptoms. We assume it's not too long because it's such a fast illness, but we don't know. In the case of slower progressive brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease, you can see pathology in someone's brain for a decade or more before they see any symptoms. I don't think that's the case for prion disease because of its rapidity, but there certainly is a period of time where you have uh, pathology in the brain com uh, composed of disease causing prions that you're not gonna have symptoms, but we just don't know how long a time period that is. So again, theoretically, I guess the answer to your question is that could potentially happen. But again, there has to be a biological plausibility for why that would occur. And I think there's a lot lacking in that biological plausibility. And again, that's discussed at that, um, that short clip of uh, discussion with Dr. Maddox from last year's virtual conference. Uh, so I believe I've gotten through all the questions. Uh, thank you very much to all the family members uh, for your support over the years. Um, we're sorry that we have to do what we do, but uh, we are very appreciative of your support. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to work with you, um, as well as the CJD Foundation. Uh, again, like I said in the beginning, if you have a spare moment, please drop a line, uh, either a telephone call or email to the uh, Surveillance Center, just expressing your thanks to some of our staff. Um, and it uh, looks like we will be able to end in time for the opening pitch of the All-Star Game. So thank you very much for um, your attention and again, for your support.